to go in sub three in the marathon, knocking 22 minutes off my PB in the process is going to be my biggest challenge to date. I've never actually done an ultra marathon, but I've always been amazed and inspired by those who take on these epic challenges. And challenges don't get much more epic than the winter spine race. It's a 268 mile route, the total length of the Pennine Way from Edel in England's Derbyshire all the way across the border to Kirk Yetham. It's billed as Britain's most brutal race and for good reason. It goes across three national parks and you've got seven days to complete it. Fellow Felons Valley Spartan Adrian Bussolini has just completed this epic challenge in just five days. That's more than 50 miles a day, all in really cold conditions and many hours in the dark. Adrian's final section of the course, he finished quicker than anyone else in the race, including the overall winner, Jack Scott. Organizers said Adrian's sprint finish was one of the quickest they'd ever seen. And he actually finished the final 5K of the course in 27 minutes and 38 seconds. That's pretty mind blowing stuff. Adrian has very kindly agreed to talk to me just eight days after completing this epic challenge. I'm really looking forward to speaking to Adrian, taking in those words of wisdom, and yeah, banking some of that inspiration for when I take on my sub free attempt. And hopefully there'll be some nuggets of wisdom in, in this for you too. So join me as I chat to Adrian Bussolini, the 29th finisher in the Winter Spine Race 2024. Let's get into it. So I am here with Adrian Bussolini. Hello. Who has just completed the Winter Spine Race. First of all, huge congratulations, mate. Thanks, Nick. It was super inspiring to watch that dot and many others over the past week or so. And uh, yeah, it's great to just be able to have the opportunity to chat with you now. So um, first things first, how are the legs? How is the body? How are the feet? Surprisingly good. Um, I thought I was going to be completely broken after this race. And yeah. Look at me, it's a week on. I'm moving. <laughs> I'm moving for about 30 seconds, but let's yeah. hope it keeps up, right? And, and this is your first, very first run. Very first run, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I wouldn't be doing if it weren't for you, so you're <laughs> responsible for this one. Now, I will say that like, I did say to Adrian whenever he's ready, and you suggested today, so we are just for people, uh, we're eight days since you completed the spine. 268 miles. And what did you say it was today? Interval session, was it? <laughs> now we are going super easy. Whatever we Adrian are. is happy to do, I am happy to do as well. So, just going back to the start, before you set off, I just want to get an idea of kind of, you know, how you were feeling about it, you know, what was going through your mind, how you were preparing. How was I feeling about it? Yeah. Massively, massively underprepared. Okay. Um, yeah, goodness me. I started preparing for the spine back in September. Yeah. Um, so I'd had a decent period of, you know, going through the managing kit list, trying to sort all of that out. Um, but honestly, I took my last delivery on the Friday afternoon, and I was leaving on the Saturday morning. Right. Uh, to head up for kit check. Okay. So yeah, I was working late into that night, trying to burn through some items on the to-do list. Um, yeah, 2.30 a.m. I was trying to build my, oh. my checkpoint checklist. Oh get that laminated at 3 a.m., be up at seven. So yeah, standing on the start line, I wasn't feeling massively prepared, if I'm honest. But um, yeah, trepidatious. It was so cold on the start line, absolutely freezing. And you're just thinking, what am I doing here? <laughs> but, <laughs> and this was your, the furthest you've ever run in a, in a race, is that right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The furthest before this is probably, uh, it must be UTMB, so 170 odd kilometers. Okay. And Dragon's Back, but that's multi-stage. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it was, it was a step into the unknown, really. A few steps. <laughs> yeah, many, many steps. And just in terms of the kind of the early part of the race, I know the organizers said when you uh, crossed the line that you'd mentioned you'd thought about pulling out just well not too too far after checkpoint one, which is still very far 
but obviously in terms of the whole race not so much so yeah just tell me a little bit about that what, what happened i'll be honest my, my race kind of ended after checkpoint one right um it started coming back maybe checkpoint three and there was a kind of build through to checkpoint five where i felt like it was on again but yeah yeah things i had a i had a strong section up to checkpoint one and i was feeling reasonably good when i came in there and when i left and how far is that just just to say Ooh, um must be must be about 60 70 kilometers okay in so not massively far but yeah it must be about five ten k after checkpoint one everything started to go wrong and it just felt like it wasn't gonna just felt impossible um so yeah i think the first thing that happened when my feet just fell apart right um which isn't something that tends to happen to me let alone after 70k um i think what was happening was it's, it was so cold and the ground was frozen so you're going over these like churned up farmers fields yeah that are just rock solid oh. and it's just carving into your feet so my feet were absolutely wrecked and that pain was really starting to set in about that point and i thought it's only going to get worse from here yeah, right yeah. and the other big problem i had was my shoulder so that suddenly flared up and i had to physically stop and take the pack off and i was standing there beside this reservoir in the dark in the freezing cold thinking you know if i can't carry my pack then yeah you know what am I going to do? Run the race holding it like this in front of me? Yeah. You know. God. So at that point, it just felt... I, I couldn't see how I could get to the next monitoring point, let alone, you know, another 200 odd miles. And so, like, how did you get through that? The same strategy that... that you would use in any in any race, right? To break up the marathon or break up the yeah. UK. Um... Because yeah, at that point, I genuinely thought that I'd be dropping out at the next monitoring point or at CP2 or before, even if I couldn't get there. Yeah. So it was just a case of let's just try and get another case, try and get another mile. Let's just try and get somewhere. Let's just try and go forward, see where we get to. But yeah, dire times. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, times. I cannot imagine. I really can't. Um... And so when did you feel like things changed for you? What was the kind of turning point, I guess? I guess I had, uh, had issues with my feet throughout the, throughout the race. Um, the shoulder was on and off. Yeah. Um, when did things change? It was, there was a gradual build, as I say, up to CP3, where I was just getting, the more progress you make, the more you work through these issues, the more you, you start to think, okay, maybe I can go, I can go further than I thought. Yeah. I think by the time you get to sort of halfway through the race or whatever, and this this issue that you thought was going to stop you outright hasn't, and you're yeah. still going with it, well, you feel you're in with a bit more of a shot. But the nature of the spine, you're, you're never sure you're going to finish until until you finish. Really? Yeah, I was going to ask that actually. Like, was there a point where? You felt this is it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm there. <laughs> it was right at the end. Um, I mean, kind of. I think after after hut one on the, on the Cheviot, so that was yeah. probably probably the point where I felt that it would take quite something to stop me. Yeah. Um, so that was just after the the Good Samaritan uh, award. But I guess we'll get to that. Yes, we will. We will. What would you say was kind of the hardest or the lowest moment in the race for you? <laughs> Dare I ask? <laughs> no, a few of those. <laughs> yeah. It's probably quite a relatively benign section um, approaching checkpoint three. So this is between uh, between Middleton and Teesside and Langley Beck, where the, this is the new location for the yeah. checkpoint. Um, you've got a sort of 10k stretch along the, along the river. Sounds fairly nice. Yep. Um, and yeah, I just thought, you know, 10k, I'll be back in 
back at the checkpoint in an hour, you know, happy days. And that stretch just never ended. It just got tougher and tougher and tougher. The day turned to night and the weather turned to, to rain, to hail, to wind. Um, you know, we ended up on, you know, ice scrambling descents and just feeling like this, this was just not going to end. Uh, I was just shouting into the into the hail at the end, you know. <laughs> Bloody brutal race, what are you? Yeah. yeah. What have I got to do to get to this checkpoint? Um, but then I got to the Langdon Beck checkpoint and it was the best checkpoint. It had a roaring fire, uh, so cosy, so warm. Uh, they, they were serving curry. Um, nice sort of, was it like a nice sort of dal. Yeah, and dal. Oh, it was just the perfect antidote to that horrendous section. So I felt like I got back, you know, I, all of that pain that went into that little river stretch, I just got back in terms of just the warmth and uh, recuperation of that checkpoint. Brilliant. And was, was that where you kind of took your longest breath? Yeah. Was that it was, was, four? it was my second longest at that yeah. but yeah. Yeah, checkpoint four went a little bit wrong. I, I may have, you know, slept through my alarm right. and I may have been woken up by some very kindly volunteers to warn me that I only had, you know, less than an hour to get out of the checkpoint. Oh, um, right, yeah. There's, is uh, it like seven and a half hours or something? It's eight, 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 eight hours. hours. Time. Okay. And you might think eight hours, you know, that's, that's a long time. But yeah. There's so much to sort out with regard to kit in this race. You need to spend an hour and a half, two, two and a half hours just sorting your kit out. Wow. And so I've got to ask you about Crossfell. So this is the, yeah. the highest point in the race. It's about 900 meters. Uh, and there was a period of time where basically the race stopped. People were held at different checkpoints close to Crossfell because of the conditions. And I think only sort of three people, you had to go in groups of a minimum of three to, uh, to go and tackle it. So yeah, so so you, tell, tell me what happened. <laughs> so if you talk to different spine racers, you're going to get completely different answers to this right. question about how was Crossfell yeah. in 2024. And for me, I was so, so fortunate that it was by far and away the highlight of my race. Really? So yeah, I got there. Well, so I, I, I did the night section over Cauldron Snout and High Cup Nick. And that was actually fine. It was a, it was a glorious night, packing through the snow, kind of happy as Larry. Um, went through Dufton, and then you, you start to go up Great Dunfell and, and then across Crossfell. Um, so I was doing this in the daytime. Uh, it was calm, the skies were blue, um, sun was kind of out. And I can't describe to you just how magical that experience was you, you're on, on the top of this you know deep snow covered fell and all around you the full panorama is i've never experienced anything like this before in england you know to my left is the lake district you've got just all of those fells laid out before you to the left yeah. to your right you've got the pennines all around you you've got this winter wonderland um it's just glorious if you kind of you know if you squint a bit you could be in the alps really <laughs> there's all the fells of snow snow tops yeah so yeah they're a bit squat compared to compared yeah. to the alps but it could you could be there and like i say it was just the best experience well i've got to say that's not what i was expecting based on <laughs> some of what i heard from others but uh yeah no, so sounds about, amazing about 12 hours prior so if I'd have been a bit quicker, basically, <laughs> I would have been going through there in the blizzard um, where people had near whiteout conditions. And yeah, there was, there was a, there were some people who got into difficulty up there. I think one of the female race leaders ended up, you know, rescuing a couple of people there and mountain rescue job. Right, gosh. Um, so yeah, I had a <laughs> slightly different experience. Um, but yeah, running running through the fairly deep snow in places, you know, breaking new ground. It's quite a bit of, quite a lot of work breaking through fresh snow. Um, you know, your foot kind of yeah falls through the snow and then stops 
and then breaks through again and falls further. You never know how far your foot's going to fall. Um, it's, yeah, it's fun, it's fun. If you say so, mate, <laughs> if you say so. <laughs> so, yeah, tell us about that Good Samaritan moment. Uh, just for the people who don't know, actually, so basically if, if people do carry out a, a Good Samaritan act during the spine, they try and work out exactly kind of how much time that, that period of, you know, takes. So you, you were given back 35 minutes at the end of the race for that, for that act. So yeah, tell us a little bit about what happened. So this was, this was up on the Cheviots. I had no idea what the Cheviots were going to be like. Yeah. It was a bit, just in the back of my mind throughout the whole race. You know, the, the forecast was really quite cold. I think they were talking about it feels like negative 18 or something. Yeah. Um, I don't Gosh. even know what negative 18 is no. like. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, high wind speeds. Um, as I say, I just don't know what the Cheviots are like. So, yeah, it was, it was, it was tough up there. You've got to... You know, picture it, it's, it's, it's night time, it's pitch black up there. Yeah. The wind is howling, it is just unbelievably cold, it is incredibly isolated and remote. You know, it feels like you're on some other planet up there. You're running through, you know, there's this just kind of undergrowth with, you know, little tracks and trails, flagstones, they're all iced over. So you're slipping, you're sliding, you're falling, you're injuring yourself. It's really slow going and it, it just feels like you're in the back end of nowhere up there, all alone. Um, I was battling the sleep demons a bit at that point as well. Yeah. I, I, my foot was a different foot injury now, proper foot injury, really, really hurt. Um, so I was nursing myself through that. So all this was going on. Yeah. And. Uh, yeah, out of the darkness to my right, this this crazed figure emerges, and he's just blundering through the undergrowth, poles just wailing either side of him. And I, I got to see his facial expression, and it was just crazed. You know, it was he was this was a man that was concerned. Yeah. Oh, good golly, you know what on earth's going on here? Um, so yeah, he. he he got to me and he just said, you know, where's hut one? I need to get to hut one. Medics are in hut one. He obviously didn't really know where he was. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I took a while just calming him down and trying to get a bit of an explanation out of him, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Turns out uh, he was trying to assist another runner on not the same race as me, actually. They were both on the Challenger North race, Spire yeah. Challenger North which is just the top half of it. Um, and this other runner was experiencing severe abdominal pain. Um, and I thought, good golly, you know, this is not the place you want to be experiencing severe abdominal pain yeah. in, these, in these temperatures, in these conditions. Um, so I was trying to understand where he was. And then out of the darkness, this other figure emerges and he's bent double over his poles. You know, it wasn't right. He lifted his pace, face up and you could really see he was in, he was in some pain. But he was moving. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I got this guy to, to kind of show me how he was moving so I could gauge whether he could make good progress or not toward hut two. He wasn't too bad, he was making progress. So I kind of said, right, it's about two and a half K yeah. to hut two, let's, let's progress toward that. You know, I'll, I'll lead and uh, we'll see where we get. There's no phone signal to, to call yeah. for help. Um, after a little while, I was just growing concerned about this guy because he was really, really struggling. So I said, I'll run on to hut, to hut one uh, and I'll bring back the medics. And I left the guy who was helping with directions and yeah. instructions. And I went on, I got about halfway to hut one, pelting it. Um, when I thought this wasn't such a good idea. I just didn't trust that they'd be able to follow the route. Yeah. I thought, oh God, I'm going to be bringing back people in a different way. Yeah. And so I went back to them and I kind of ran with them, running on ahead and, and kind of shining my torch back yeah. so they could see the route. Uh, when I got to the sort of fence post by the corner, that goes down to hut one, I pegged it down there, got the spine safety team members back. Uh, and they, they kind of accompanied him, accompanied him 
back to the hut. Um, they've got the medics on him. And unfortunately, he, he, he retired there, but right. yeah, he, he wasn't really in a fit state to continue. Um, and the help had got, you know, got some hot tea in him and started to look a bit better. Right, so good. yeah, it was a, it woke me up. Yeah, um, I can imagine. Woke me up. And to be honest, it's, it, it was a little bit helpful because it just gave me this massive boost of adrenaline. So, yeah, for a while after that, I was running pretty strong. Yeah. Um, my foot took a battering for all this, of course, but um, yeah, it swings and roundabouts. It certainly woke me up. It feels quite, quite, quite a severe situation. Yeah. It's just so cold up there. And you've got someone who's not really able to move, certainly not able to nav. You know, that's, that could be quite a severe situation for that person. Yeah, yeah. So you just switch, flick straight, up, straight over to how do we, how do we resolve this? Oh, uh, so yeah, you. actually it was, it was a simple decision. Still, no, very admirable, it's really, it's really good that that happens throughout this fine race. I saw there were so many people that actually had these uh, yeah, acts yeah. to their name, so. No, it's, it's brilliant to see. So it's obviously called the Winter Spine Race. I guess you're prepared for fairly cold conditions, but it was definitely the, some of the temperatures I was seeing out there were quite difficult to fathom, to be honest. So yeah, tell us a little bit about yeah what the conditions are like. Well, it was a learning experience for me as well. You know, not used to running in negative whatever they were most of the time yeah you add on wind chill and it, it gets uh i mean just the, the wind chill at points in that race like that, that fell after checkpoint five bellingham by golly i mean it was quite a you know sunny day down at ground level quite nice i started off in relatively light like here and yeah i got to some altitude the wind hit me i thought oh i better put the top on that's that's quite something yeah. I put a top on and I thought, oh, I better put another top on. Put another top on and I thought, hmm, I better put another top on. I put another top on and I thought, hmm, I better put the buff on. I put the buff on. I thought, hmm, better put a hat on. Put another hat on. I thought, hmm, I'm going to need some serious gloves. You know, within within you know a few minutes, I basically put all my gear on. Um, such was the the wind. So, yeah, it's temperatures that I haven't really experienced before up there how was it you need a lot of kit yeah you know I was running with eight upper layers at times which is a lot to manage if you think about that if you get a runnable section where you're suddenly going to be generating a lot more body heat and you've got eight layers on it's not something you can just easily quickly adjust um, so it's, it's, it's complex you know I was running with uh, some really good mitts so I had some Fury gloves and then I had some, some proper uh, Montan dry line mitts which were really good um, only problem was I kept dropping them so if you look at my actual track and style you'll probably see loads of points where I'm like going back and forth and back and forth and that's because I was dropping my gloves and going oh crap I've got to run back 400 meters to find the glove pick it up again get back to doing what I was doing um, which needed me to take my mitts off again and then look down to try and put them back on again and I've dropped the thing again go back to the same point I've got back up before really dispiriting but yeah it's challenges like that it's it's your water being constantly frozen so people have warned me about this beforehand um, so what I've done is I bought a salamon insulated flask specifically designed to be used in cold conditions and I thought well yeah, at least I'll have, you know, 400 mils there that I'll be able yeah. to use. Um, but even that, even my specially adapted salmon insulated flask froze again and again and again. So you come out of a, you know, a checkpoint or a, something, you've got, I was carrying about one and a quarter litres. Within, you know, within 10 minutes, Unless you get, but all you've got is the, the quarter litre that I had close to my body on my running belt and everything else is frozen up. If you're really careful, if you kind of 
keep sipping from a flask you can kind of keep it going uh, for a bit longer but yeah water was a problem um, and yeah just the amount of kit you've got to carry and the amount of time it takes you to sort this out at checkpoints as well preparing for the upcoming leg um, there's weird things like I think it was checkpoint three it was Langdon Beck with the roaring cozy fire um, I knew I was going to have really cold conditions overnight coming out of that so I started putting on all my layers uh, in preparation for that as I was sorting my kit out yeah. and then I was suddenly swept by this overwhelming sense of my body overheating I've got about eight layers on right by this roaring fire yeah and I just had to rip everything off pretty much down to my base layer I just sat there sweating buckets thinking right I'm gonna need to basically carry all my gear through kit check and then oh my get my shoes on and then put it on and go straight outside um, yeah it's a funny old race this but um, yeah it, it, the, the temperatures are manageable with the right gear um, it took me three months to buy all the gear yeah yeah no, I've actually read that some people were saying that like just the logistics involved of getting everything you need becomes even almost as much of a challenge as preparing for the race itself but. yeah absolutely that was that was just such a big such a big job and really what I what I realized was that I needed to the level of preparation I was at the night before the race I needed to be there you know at least another three months in advance wow um, yeah, I mean they call this a expedition race that was designed to be as close a proxy to an Arctic expedition as you can manage in this country. And you really do have to treat it with that level of, uh, you know, that level of preparation. Okay, so final few questions for me. I don't want you to keep on your feet too much longer. Thanks, Nick. After that <laughs> epic challenge, I just coming to the finish now, like. I feel like you were so consistent throughout the race and obviously it's hard to judge when you're just watching a dot but you seem to be kind of going along fairly consistently consistently throughout and then just the last bit of the race I feel like you were supercharged or something because you I think you went up from like I smell that finish <laughs> yeah <laughs> sort of 40th position to well ending finishing in, in 29th and I was saying in the intro that organizers said the finish that you did was one of the fastest sprint finishes they've ever seen. And I don't know if you know, but I'm pretty sure that final section you did from hut two was the quickest of anyone in the race. So tell me about that finish. What was going through your mind at that point? How were you able to finish so strong? Well, I guess the main thing to understand is a lot of the race was a lot slower than I I wanted it to be. Yeah. Um, and that was, I mean, partially due to my feet. Um, but it was partially due to the fact that you're running on ice for most of this race. Certainly this year. Yeah. Um, it's sheet ice. It's black ice. It's ice covered in just the thinnest layer of snow so you can't see it. And so you're continually slipping, sliding and falling over and bashing yourself up which is I mean demoralizing to say the least but it's you're picking up injuries all the time and that's how I picked up that foot injury over the cheviots I picked up a nasty one there with my left hand uh, it's healing now but yeah that was my thumb got bent right the way back there uh, my hip was took a right battering it was I, you know, I, I don't run on ice normally. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've, I've worked this out. I don't run on ice. I avoid it. You know, you don't normally go out and say, oh, you know, the pavements are completely treacherous today. You know, the rocks are completely iced over. I'm going to go and run 268 miles on that. You don't do that. Yeah. But you do in this race, as it so happens. You know, I, I don't understand how the front runners run the time as they do over ice anyway yeah so that was the background it was a lot slower than i wanted um so coming yeah by the time i got past uh hut one uh where i i was helping those those two folks yeah pumped full of adrenaline um you know 
buoyed by confidence, newfound confidence over this ice. Um, yeah, I was just trying to get myself to hut two nice and quickly. And from hut two, um, it was mainly a descent to the finish. And okay, there were ice patches of that as well. But yeah, I was, I, I like to finish strong and I was focused. Um, I had loads in the legs in terms of fast running because I hadn't been doing that much of it. Yeah. Um, and I was just trying to employ everything I'd learned over the course of the race with regard to how to run on ice. And I was trying to bring that to bear in that final section and literally just run as fast as I possibly could without falling over. And I managed to do that somehow. So yeah, it felt really, that section I have felt amazing to me. It's just so good to be, to be properly running again feeling free you know feeling feeling fast um yeah there, there was a great moment at the end you, you know back at the ground level just tracking this road back into uh what well, tracking this road into kirk yet on the finish uh and there was this runner kind of walking up this really steep little hill um you'd never you'd never run up that hill normally it's far yeah. too steep but me i was just <laughs> In my head, I was just saying, empty the tank, empty the tank, empty the tank. Oh, just brilliant. So yeah, that, that finish was the easiest bit of the race for me. I could just, I could just let it all out. Hammer down to Kirk Well, I'm telling you, you were flying because I was like, right, I've been tracking most of it on my phone the whole way. But if you if you log in on a, a laptop, then you can see the finish line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was like, ah, oh, just the time is coming down. You're like, your estimated time for finish. You're just coming down and coming down. So I was like, oh, I better hop on the laptop before work. This was 9 a.m. on a Friday morning, just over a week ago. And you were too bloody quick. By the time I got onto it, you'd finished. So, uh, it wasn't, no. It wasn't just you. I didn't even <laughs> finish. Uh, when, I, when I crossed the finish line, all I could see, you know, there was no one else there apart from this photographer. Yeah. The panicked expression of face, pelting it out of the Border Hotel. Sort of, you know, he had his camera outstretched in hand, you know, frantically snapping shots. Um, and yeah, everyone else followed. But <laughs> no, it was, a, no, it was a truly epic finish to an epic race. And yeah, just a couple more questions. How did it feel to touch the iconic wall which marks the end of the race. So what was that like? I mean, I forgot to touch it at first. Right. I crossed the line and it was just like, yeah. Where is everybody? Yeah. Um, I didn't feel like to touch the wall. Um, it did feel like a special moment, actually. Um, there, was, there was something, there's something about traveling such a long way over such, frankly, treacherous terrain for the most part. And yeah, you make, you've made it to this tiny little village <laughs> somewhere in Scotland, you know, near yeah. the Cheviots. Tiny little place. I don't know where you are. You don't know where you've been most of the time on yeah. this race. But yeah, this thing, there's suddenly there's this wall that you recognise from photos. You're like, oh, I know this. <laughs> um, it was, yeah, it was quite a cool little moment. Um, but I don't know, I was, I was feeling really really strong at that point I could have I could, I could have gone on because it was yeah that was that that's exactly what I'm good at you know running on on that sort of yeah. terrain um, so yeah it was a bit weird I, I could have gone on oh, I think 268 was actually 272 on your Strava I saw so an extra, all, all that backtracking to ex pick up my yeah, nuts, yeah extra so. extra four miles in there but yeah I think that's far far enough for most of us at least um so one thing i really wanted to ask you was is there anything that really kind of stands out in your mind that helps kind of make this possible like any sort of i guess piece of advice you can offer people that are going to take on a an epic challenge for them whatever that may be whether that's 5k 10k half marathon marathon ultra or something as epic as the winter spine race like what would your yeah what would your piece of advice be to to anyone that's 
wants to go further or faster than they've ever gone before. I mean, everyone's going to be coming at this from different <laughs> levels of experience and with different yeah. goals and challenges in mind. But I think, I think for me, it's that it's that appreciation of the importance of the challenge. So, you know, the spine was one of you know, a list of things I've attempted that, you know, sounded crazy. How the hell are you going to run 268 miles over over mountains and snow and ice? Um, in the middle of winter, in the middle of January, Northern England, Scotland. Impossible. Um, but you employ the same tactic that you employ for anything. You just break it up. You tackle it in stages. You, 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 you're doing the thing you're doing now, putting one front of your foot in front of the other. Yeah. And keep doing that. Keep the fuel going in. Keep the hydration going in. And it's amazing what you can achieve with that. Yeah, you know, with living in the present moment like that. Um, but I, yeah, the message I would get out is to seek out those challenges, those things you don't think you can do. Because it's in that problem solving. That's where the growth is. That's where, you know, that's where that learning is. That's where the growth is. Yeah. And that's really where the victory lies. It's not about, you know, the finish line. It's not about touching the wall. It's about that personal growth over the course of the journey. Um, and yeah, now I feel in a very different position to the one in which I started. I've learned so much. I could, I would tackle that race completely differently next time. And uh, yeah, that's that's the valuable bit. So if, if if you're not feeling concerned about your next challenge, pick a bigger challenge. <laughs> Wow, no, that's quite a way to finish. So Adrian, thank you so much for your time. Finished 29th out of, I think it was about 165 people that started, 91 finishes. Everyone's incredible, but hats off to you. It's been a pleasure watching you. You're watching your progress and seeing you finish and now hearing back about it now. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Absolute Nick. Absolute legend. Great chatting. Adrian Vassilini is going to be doing a blog on this he does epic blogs on trail explorer the trail explorer uk so um, i'll post a link to that in the description once that's live and uh yeah can hear all more more about the race that way as well but to say absolute pleasure love spending this time with you if your first run back cheers thank you mate thanks Nick. you enjoyed that as much as me that was a uh, really fascinating to get just a small insight really into what Adrian experienced on that race as I say the blog that will do will give much more detail than any than this video could possibly provide but yeah just really lovely to just be able to spend a bit of time find out more about what Adrian went through and quite frankly what he achieved so appreciate obviously again this video like the last one like joining a running club a little bit different to some of what I've done before but hopefully you enjoyed it so yeah I'd love to hear from you about what challenges you've got coming up so let me know in the comments what you thought of the interview what you're aiming for this year if you've enjoyed the video then please consider giving it a like if you do want to follow my journey I've got Watford Half Marathon coming up, it's my next race, uh, so look out for that one. Please do subscribe if you want to see when that video comes out. And yeah, there's nothing more to say then, I'll see you on the next one. Cheers. Um, so before we get to that, I was just going to ask, um, I forgot what I was going to ask. <laughs> <laughs>